Hello, I'm Brenda Howard, and this is Applied Occupational Theory, and today we are discussing part two of motor control and motor learning. And so in the last edition, I left you with uh, a question about how people learn to move and why is it important that we understand the complexity of the brain when it comes to learning how to move um, after we've had an illness or injury. And of course, the answer is, that movement is very complex and it requires both the sensory input, the motor output, but also an understanding of how the occupation and the environment influence how we move. And this is the piece that was missing in motor control. So in motor learning, we talk about that it's heterarchy, not hierarchy. Of course, this is a term that should be familiar to you from the model of human occupation that it's the idea that there are multiple influences and that one thing is going to be influenced by everything else in the movement process. So one of the things that we've learned is that the higher and lower centers of our motor system learn to interact cooperatively and with our musculoskeletal system. That people have preferred patterns of movement, but th these preferred patterns can be perturbated or changed by anything in the environment or anything in the occupation that we are choosing to do. Now these changes then become control parameters. So for example, if we are learning to type on a different keyboard that maybe has its keys in a slightly different location, we are going to have to learn a different set of movements that we're going to do. So our control parameters are forcing us into a different set of movements. What about if you're using a QWERTY keyboard on your phone instead of on your computer? You're gonna use your fingers differently even though the keys are in the same location. And this is one example that helps us think about the vast amount of brain real estate that's required to help us plan our movements. So we have to take in the sensory information that we're receiving. Our brain has to think about what our response is we have to encode that into words. We then encode those words into letters. We then produce those letters through movements of our fingers. And then somebody else can look at the word that we've produced and decode it and understand our meaning as a result. So a lot of cognitive processes go into uh, and come out of the movements that we produce. So as people are seeking these optimal solutions, for accomplishing a task, it's all about the context. The context forces us to behave in different ways. So it's not about cephalocaudal, proximodistal. It's about how people move within the um, tasks that they want to do. It's all about the unique characteristics of the individual, the variations on the environment, and the task that's being completed. And of course, this is why occupational therapists can bring a great deal to the table when it comes to motor control and motor relearning, because we understand those influences on the person. We understand the influences of the occupation that the person desires. We understand the influence of the um, variety of environments that a person might be in. So Karen Shepard called this motor relearning and it says that in order to learn, we have to have a specific task focus. We can't just use cones and pegs. We have to have a specific task that the person wants to do, and we need to analyze that, and then the client masters the missing components of the movements um, that the person needs to be able to do. The therapist will offer feedback. That feedback can be verbal or it can be a physical cue. And we have a shift in our thinking away from normalizing movement to think about that there are no abnormal movement patterns. There's only people adapting to the constraints on the movements that they have. Now, heterarchy. We have to think about that there's an almost infinite number of circumstances that people move within. This is called contextual variability. No two instances of the same action are alike. So this is like back to our example of signing our name. We might sign our name on um, a keypad at the grocery store. We might sign it in the sand with our toe. We might sign it vertically on a marker board. There are some similarities um, to the way that we're doing these, but the control parameters 
change the task in an infinite number of ways. So why is it that a baseball game is interesting? It's because we never know what happens when the person is going to throw the ball because there's an infinite number of circumstances under which they can throw that ball. The fatigue they have, the, um, the circumstances of, of where the batter is, uh, you know, the, the way they happen to be standing. The person, the task, and the environment are all controlling the person's movement. Now, Catherine Tromley says that this is best facilitated through meaningful objects and goal-oriented activities. So if we're trying to get positive outcomes in our clients with coordinated movement, we have to make it meaningful. So the occupation and the occupational context are most important in that movement recovery. Now, here's an activity that I have for you in regard to control parameters. What I want you to do is go to the kitchen and get a bunch of different kinds of cups and glasses and water bottles, fill them with some water. If you've got someone around that can be a partner with you in this, then I want you to close your eyes and have them place in front of you one of these drinking containers. And I want you to go to pick it up and watch how the control parameters will change the activity for you. Now this is called emergence. As we spontaneously change our complex motor actions because of the interactions with the task, the environment, we can see how the control parameters are changing the motor action. So take a moment, pause the video, and use some of these words to discuss what are the control parameters of these various drinking objects that are causing your movement to emerge in different ways. So as you're thinking about that activity with the different glasses and, and drinking objects, what was the role of the sensory feedback? How did the sensory feedback from the objects that you touched change your emergence? Now, one of the things that the motor learning theory says is that the central nervous system doesn't even have to modulate this. This is occurring on a spinal level and that there's much less information needed um, in the brain to, to complete that movement than we previously thought with our motor control or motor program exclam exclamation for how we move. Another thing to think about is attractor states. Now attractor states is a math term and it's a set of physical properties toward which a system tends to evolve. So this is more, we've talked about the task and the environment. Now we're talking about the person. A person does have preferred patterns of movements that we would call our attractor states. And in part, our attractor states do not require centralized instructions because these patterns that we use to do our movements emerge from this dynamic interaction of the person, the task, and the environment. So thinking back to the activity with the glasses, how did your attractor states emerge? How was your grasping of the cup or the bottle different from the way in which somebody else might have done it? What are the components of your attractor state? Um, and how could you then define what somebody else's attractor state is? And then put together a sentence that lets you think about how the changing of the control parameters caused emergence of variations in your attractor state. This is the sort of language that I would expect to see in a case study that was examining a motor learning approach to a person regaining their ability to move. So this brings us to what would we do for evaluation or assessment with an individual? Well, there's a lot of observation that would occur, we, and we can't just sit and talk to a person about what they want to be able to do. We have to actually see them do it. So we have to get them up and movement moving. We might have them do some activities of daily living, and we might select some functional tasks that they chose within contexts that are important to them. Might we also do range of motion manual muscle test, and especially in pediatric cases, reflex testing? Yes, we might. But there also might be some better assessments that we would choose um, that can look at a person's ability to move. Um, and there are, there are some assessments out there for that. So what about intervention? 
For a task-oriented approach, we want to select functional movements in preparation for a goal. So no more cones and pegs. Choose things that are functional everyday objects for a person that is preparing them for a clear functional goal that is client-centered. Now, another important principle is overload. We have to spend more total time in therapy than we previously thought was necessary. So rather than just spending five or 10 minutes, we're talking about three hours a day, which is the norm within um, many of these task-oriented approaches uh, for helping a person regain their movement. We need real-life object manipulation and as much as possible in the context in which the person is going to perform them. If we can't actually be in their particular context, then we need to mimic their natural environment as much as possible. We also need to progress the exercise from easier to more difficult. We cannot do the same exercise over and over and over until they accomplish that. We have to vary the exercise as we're going along. Because remember, we're trying to get a person to be able to move within a variety of contexts and a variety of task approaches. We give them feedback as we go along. This can be verbal feedback. This can be physical feedback. So just uh, like touching cues. We want to have them move within multiple planes. So we're not just moving things, you know, in the same way at the same time. We might have them going up or down with the movements that we choose. Uh, the patient training load is going to be customized. So we might create for the person a little circuit that they can do at home. As much as possible, we want to do total skill practice, not just components of the skill. Um, we, and we want to build up to that total skill practice. And we need random practice throughout the day, throughout um, the, the space in which they're moving. Um, and we have distributed practice as well, rest throughout the day, and we need them to practice with both hands as much as possible. Now I have some example videos for you. One is with a toddler who had a stroke and the other is with an adult. I want you to watch these videos and then in this case for 2020, I'm going to have you complete a Google form uh, to respond to some questions in regard to these videos that you're watching. And as you're doing that, think about how would you design an intervention with a task-oriented approach principle. So let's say we're using the cups or drinking as an activity. So you would want to think about what are the steps? Um, would you work on steps first or the whole task? The answer would should be both and. Uh, we need to look at the steps, but we also need to have whole task practors, uh, practice. We're also going to look at altering the control parameters and look at how we would elicit emergent movement within the person's own attractor states. I also have um, opportunity for you to consider um, comparing and contrasting motor control and motor learning. How are they alike? How are they different? Um, what would you do um, that could be similar between the two approaches and what would be very different between the two approaches? And here are some of mine. Uh, that you can take a look at as well.